Why do we say amen? Our God is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. We thank him for the blessing and the privilege of prayer. But we know that when we pray, it is not time wasted. That when we lift our voices to heaven in concert, when we come together in times of corporate intercession, that God is listening to every word and that every concern that we raise gets his attention. And maybe God doesn't necessarily do everything that we ask him to do, but we know that he acts, doesn't he? He moves, doesn't he? That God moves and he moves in his own time and moves in his own way. But when he moves, there is no doubt that God is working. Amen? Amen. And so I hope that we would all continue to pray with confidence. Prayer does not, is not a matter of understanding. When you pray, it is not necessary for you to understand exactly how God will work. Because if you understood everything, would you pray? If you knew all the ins and outs and if you knew what was necessary, would you pray? That's debatable, but I'm just going to go out on a limb and say you probably wouldn't pray as much. <laughs> and so God doesn't ask you to understand how to do everything. God just wants you to trust him. He just wants us to believe him. That's what we call faith. Faith is not understanding. Faith is belief and trust in God, knowing that God will do what is best, knowing that God will have always sufficient resource, knowing that God will always have the answers, and that God will always do what will bring him glory first. And when he gets glory, we can't help but be blessed. Amen. Amen. We thank God for the blessing and the privilege of prayer. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you turn with me to the gospel recorded by St. Luke, Luke's gospel there, there is a narrative of scripture there, an episode that takes place between Jesus and a crowd of people. For the last couple of weeks, I have been preaching some sermons about discipleship and the church's true call and mission, who we should be in this world and what our activity should be uh, guided by. I, I'm, I'm challenged and convicted by God to make sure that in my preaching and in my leadership that we never lose sight of who we are as a people. We had a great time on last Sunday in our exercise and discussion of fellowship and what it means to be true Christian community. Today, this morning, I want us to really focus now, moving onward from fellowship and really understanding the essence of the personal commitment that all of us must make as we seek to walk with God and to grow in him. In the 14th chapter in the Gospel of Luke there, you'll find these words beginning with verse number 25. Luke chapter 14, verse number 25. It says that large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him. Saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up 
everything, everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I want to talk this morning about this thought, the cost of being a disciple. The cost of being a disciple. September is here. Whether you like it or not, tomorrow will be September 1. I get excited about this time of year because the fall in September tells me that it is football season. And you know there's only one team that matters during football season. And they wear blue and silver. Ain't but one real team with blue and silver. Right, Calvin? See, Calvin got his blue on today. Ain't but one real team. There's another team out there that wears blue and silver. Somewhere, somewhere in Michigan, I think it's Detroit. Detroit, the Lions. I'm not talking about that team. I'm talking about the, the Cowboys, America's team, down in the southern part of the country. I got the microphone so I can... I can talk about the, anybody, any cowboy fans, let me just survey the congregation. I need to, to see if I'm in good company. I, I know if I, I ought to get some amens this morning from some cowboy fans. But you know, every Monday and Wednesday, I come in and there's a group of brothers. And we talk shop. We talk football. I'm not going to call any names, but we got some Pittsburgh Steeler fans. We got some Detroit Lion fans down there. We got some New York fans down there. We got some, uh, some Jets fans down there. We got some Denver fans, Miami fans. We even got some brothers down there who just claim the team that wins. And the point is this, that, that, that we all have chosen some team that we have some appreciation for and the team However the team performs, it, 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 it almost influences our demeanor, our outlook, our behavior. I, if, if the Cowboys win, it's a good Sunday afternoon for me. When they don't win, it's just difficult to get through the, the rest of the day. If the Cowboys lose on Sunday and Detroit wins, Wednesday's rough for me when I meet the brothers downstairs. But if the Cowboys win and the Lions lose on Sunday, then I enjoy coming in. <laughs> but you know, it doesn't matter how big a fan you are for your team. Doesn't matter how much paraphernalia you own and how many jerseys we buy, how many functions and fellowships we have around the big game. All of that doesn't make us a part of the team. I mean, you can yell at your TV all you want. And you can go through your game day rituals. You can put on your team socks, your team underwear, paint your hair, tailgate in your own driveway, barbecue. You can do all of that. And it won't make one difference on the field. You can be a part of the crowd. And you can have an appreciation. You can be up close. You can even, Lord, Lord willing, you can have access to the field. And you can even be there as they run out of the tunnel. Give high fives and all that. But that does not make you a part of the team. There's a big difference between following and becoming a part of. Here Jesus is in the midst of some public ministry. He's engaging individuals. A, a, a crowd of people have now started to follow him. We're talking about people beyond just his disciples. 
people beyond just those who were there and watched him do a few things. But we're talking about people who just become enamored with his celebrity. They have become so infatuated with Jesus Christ that wherever he goes, there's electricity in the air. There's a crowd. There's anticipation. There are people who are waiting because they feel like, oh, something is about to happen because Jesus is in the house. And they are there with him, following him, and some of them even want to be seen by him. I want Jesus to see me because if he sees me, he knows I'm down with him. I want Jesus to see me because if he sees me, I can get some of what he has. When we, we call these types of people in popular culture, we call them groupies. You know, groupies, the they're, they're people, groupies were people who would follow these rock and roll bands and they would leave home and they would leave their jobs and leave their careers and, and they would just follow these bands wherever they go. They would be a part of the entourage. But when it came time for showtime, you'd never see them on the stage. You, they didn't influence you buying a ticket. And they would not receive any compensation, but they just wanted to be a part of the action. They wanted to be around, and they were not making any significant contribution to the enterprise of the artist, of the act, or anything, but they just wanted to be there. Jesus had fans, crowds, but these fans were just faces in the crowd. Jesus feels their presence. It's like he feels people pushing at his back. He feels the people breathing down his neck. And somewhere in between ministry stops, he feels the unction now to address the crowd. He's not speaking to the disciples per se, but he's speaking to all the people who just want to be around the action. They just want to be nosy. They just want to show up. They just want to be a part of the crowd. They're not necessarily there to give anything to Jesus. They're not there for any significant worship, but they're there just to see what's about to happen. They just want to be a part of some stuff going on. It's not important to be there on time, and it's not important to be there contributing. They just want to be there. That sound like some people, you know, you got people who they don't want to make any contribution. They don't want to be on time and they don't want to be held accountable, but they just want to be there because they know that if they're there, they might see something happen. They might get a chance to reap some kind of benefit. They might get some stuff. They just want to be there. They just want to be a part of the crowd. And you know what? We got crowd people who pack out sanctuaries, crowd people who fill church pews, Crowd people who just want to show up and crowd people suck up air conditioning. Crowd people crowd out parking lots. Crowd people come in late and leave early. Crowd people get complained because it's too loud. Crowd people complain because we stand too long or we got to sit. Crowd people complain because the sound's not right. Crowd people complain because the preacher messing with them. Crowd people complain because nobody said good morning to them. Crowd people complain because nobody called their name. Crowd people complain because somebody got their seat. Crowd people complain because they act like Sunday morning is the only day of the week. Crowd people complain because something started without them. Crowd people complain because everything is an inconvenience and an imposition. Crowd people complain because service lasts too long. Crowd people complain because they talk too much. Crowd people complain because they seem to be fussing and picking on me. Crowd people complain because they don't take all of that. And Jesus turned to the crowd people and said, if anybody is going to be my disciple, there's some stuff that you got to do. Some things that you're going to have to go through. There's some pre-qualifications, some things you need to take into consideration. That Jesus simply is saying, I don't need crowds. I need a core. And either you're going to be in the crowd or you're going to be in the core. 
And I'm going to say this now. Either you are in the crowd or you in the court. And you need to decide which one you want to be. Now, I got some, 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 uh, you know, speculation. I got an idea about where you may be. But rather than me classify you based on my own speculation, we're going to let the word define. Where we all ought to be classified. Well, you see, everybody in here, I believe you have a desire to be a part of the team. I believe everybody in here is genuine about, I want to be a disciple. But I cannot allow us to walk in and walk out believing that what we have offered and submitted in 40 minutes on a Sunday constitutes us being a disciple. For you see, discipleship is so much more than crowd activity. Discipleship must become a matter of lifestyle, how we live and prioritize and the choices that we make. And so here, Jesus is saying right up front, for if, if any of you all want to follow me, this is not some impulsive decision that you make. You don't just wake up and say, I'm going to be a disciple. You need to understand that this takes a considerable amount of thought. Because for you to be my disciple, there are things that you must accept to be true for your life. And in becoming disciple in discipleship, we don't have the luxury to pick and to choose. And to say what we will hold on to and what we feel we don't need. So this morning, I'm going to shoot straight. I'm going to come right at us. I might step on toes. I may bruise some egos. I may bust some bubbles. I may make some folk upset. And I may make you uncomfortable. You may be convicted. And you know what? If I do all of that, then I have done my job. Because this morning, we're going to talk about discipleship and what it means to follow Christ. And just because we look a certain way doesn't mean that we are disciples. Preach, Pastor Earl. We, we go here. Jesus addresses the crowd, his fans, and teaches the true cost of discipleship. The first thing is that this relationship is the most important. Of all of our relationships, Jesus speaks very pointedly to everybody and basically tells them in no soft words. He says that if anybody is going to be my disciple, he said, you got to hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. I'm stop right there. That Jesus is not telling you, you need to go home right now. He's not telling you that you got to make a choice. He's not saying that to choose me, you turn your back on your family. This is some, a, a, Hebrew, a Hebrew idiom, uh, some Hebrew language here. And in another gospel, he says that if anyone loves his mother more than me, if he loves his father more than me, if he loves his children more than me, he cannot be my disciple. What Luke takes, and that's, this, that's what Luke is saying. Jesus has recorded here, been recorded in saying that there cannot be any other relationship that you have that is more important and reaps more investment from you than this relationship that you have with me. Jesus is saying that I know you love your mama, but your mama can't do for you what I can do. I know you love your children, but your children, I don't take back seat to children. I don't take back seat to spouses. I don't take back seat to anybody. There can be no relationship that gets greater investment from you than this relationship with me. So if you want to be my disciple, then you need to understand that I expect to be number one in your life. Now, let me help you with something. You really want things to get better in the marriage? 
You want it to get better with the children. You want it to get better with the siblings. Rather than focusing on the children and the spouse and the siblings, start first with God and Christ. I promise you, I can't tell you that you getting right with God will make them act right. But I just believe that if I work on it with God, that God has a way of taking care of some other stuff too. Because a lot of times your issue with your spouse ain't just your spouse with the problem. I have discovered through my own experience. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm out there now. I have discovered. This, I'm just telling you what I know. This ain't what I heard. Tell you what I know, that when I thought I had some issues in some family relationships, and I thought that the problems were with everybody else and not with me. But the truth was that it wasn't necessarily everybody else. But I had a problem with God as well. That I was trying my best. I was pouring myself into everybody else. And God was getting leftovers from me. Jesus is telling us here that you must hate not just flat out, not saying be mean to people, act like they don't matter and they don't care. No. Jesus is saying that you live in all of these other relationships in light of your relationship with me. That means then, how you are in your marriage is a reflection of how you are with God. Who you are to your children is a reflection of who you are to Christ. Who you are to your siblings is a reflection of who you are to Christ. And if there is breakdown in any of these other relationships, then it reveals the potential breakdown somewhere in your relationship with Christ. Jesus is saying, y'all trying to be fans. Y'all want to be down with me. But you can't be down with me if I got to ride in the back seat to some other folk. Discipleship is a matter of prioritization. And if we're going to be genuine and real disciples of Christ, then we must make sure then that we have properly ordered all of the relationships in our lives. Because anyone or any person who, got, who garners more affection and appreciation from us than God is an idol. Oh, yeah. That, that's, that's what's happening here. You know, in the Old Testament where Isaiah tells the people on behalf of God, you people honor me with your hands and your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You know, God took offense that you people bow down to these images. They got hands, but they can't feel. They got eyes, but they can't see. They got ears, but they can't hear. They got arms, but they can't embrace. Oh, yeah. We have, we practice idolatry here as well. That we've created little gods in our children. We've turned our spouses into gods. We've turned these other relationships into idol gods. And these relationships now threaten our ability to ultimately honor God in a way that truly gives him glory. Yes. In all of your good intentions to be parent of the year, you could be dishonoring God. Trying to be the man. Trying to be the woman. Trying to be big brother. Trying to be big sister. Trying to be the best and the special and the most this and the most that. We could very well be undermining our very own walk with God. Real disciples make Jesus the center then of all of their affections. In other words, I can't work Jesus in. See, we try to work Jesus into family time. Think about that. You don't work Jesus in to your family time. If you're saying that I've got to work God in, 
then what you're saying is that God is not a part of. When the truth is you have nothing without him. There is no family without God. Therefore, how do you work in what you can't live without? What sense does that make? How do I work God in when I'm saying that he is the one who sustains and keeps me? How insulting it is for God, for him to hear us say, Lord, I'm trying to find a window for you. I'm trying to work you in. Just imagine if I told my spouse, well, I'm going to have to see. Let me check some things. And, 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 and I'm no different from anybody else. We all know what it feels like to have to be worked in. Nobody likes to have to fit in an agenda. God is saying, no, I am the agenda. You work everybody else in around me. Sure, you can say, well, the kids got to be fed. They got to go to school. They got to this. They got to that. Yes, they do. And God says, and they would not have any of that had it not been for me. I am the Lord God who provides. The food that you got to feed them, where you think it comes from. The school clothes that need to be bought, who you think made provision for it. The school building, where they going to go sweet in, who do you think keeps it the beds that they sleep in at night, who do you think's hovering over them while they're sleeping? I don't slumber, nor do I sleep, but you get to sleep in your bed all night long. But I'm never asleep. I'm always on my job. I'm always keeping dangers from you. I'm always keeping food on the table. I'm always there every step of the way. And you want to work me in? What if God said, I'm going to see if I got time to bless you today. I'm going to see if I can spare some oxygen for you today. I'm going to see if I can keep the blood pumping warm right now. Let me see if I got time to take care of you. What if God said, let me see if you're going to fit in my schedule today. What if God said, I ain't got time to send air your way. I ain't got time to send food your way. Just hold your breath and hold on and see. See if I get there. I'm so glad God doesn't deal with me the way that I deal with him. God has never let me doubt whether or not he loved me. And God has never let us be in confusion about whether or not we were important to him. How do I know? Because Calvary tells me so. Calvary says that you were worth blood, my only son. And how do we repay him? How do we honor the sacrifice? We fill our lives with so much foolishness and junk, and we call it family time. We get run, ragged to and fro, all over the place. And then at the end of the day, we barely got enough strength. Lord, thank you for another. Y'all prayed that last night, didn't you? Huh? Like, oh, Lord, thank you for getting me to the. And then when the Lord wakes us up the next day, we often running again. Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be my disciple, you don't work me in. You work yourself into me. There's a difference there. I figure out how to work myself into God, but not work God into my life. Let me, let me go on. Let me mess with you a little bit more. This relationship with Christ is the most important. But then he says, therefore, then, my life, my life is no longer my own. Now, this is the troubling. This is one of these troubling statements in Scripture. Jesus tells his disciples and people in the crowd, he says that, listen, if you want to find your life, you must lose it. 
Jesus is telling you, lose your life. Narcissism. There was a, there's a character in Greek mythology, his name was Narcissus. And he was obsessed with his own reflection. He was so obsessed that he could not leave the mirror. And because he could not leave the mirror, he died. He was so obsessed with his own reflection that he couldn't even take the care, the time to care for himself, to nurture himself properly. He just stayed in the mirror, totally consumed by his own image. Since, hence, we get our word narcissistic or narcissism, that we have become so self-centered, so, so caught up in ourselves. And Jesus is saying that you can't get me because you're too full of yourself. You, you want me to come into your life, but I ain't got no room. Because everywhere I step, I keep bumping into you. And Jesus is saying that if anyone would find his life, he will lose it first. Y'all heard finders, keepers, losers, weepers? Well, it's the opposite. It's losers, keepers, finders, weepers. In other words, those people who think they got something all on their own terms, living on their own terms, they actually end up losing. But those who've ultimately surrendered their lives, surrendered themselves, given themselves up for God, laid it all on the altar, have let themselves and said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That is when you start really experiencing the favor and the blessing of God. And until you completely surrendered, you still only getting crumbs. And I know we getting blessed off them crumbs. God is doing some phenomenal things. And just think, if you getting what you getting from God based on what he gets from you, just imagine how much more you could have if you totally lost your life. See, my life is no longer my own. He says he must even hate his own life. What does it mean to hate your life? Now people are saying, well, that, that cuts across self-esteem. Well, let's really think about self-esteem. See, some of these psychological terms we have to be careful with because we try to take Scripture and the Bible and we try to make the Bible stand in line with psychology. And we try to make scripture follow psychology. But psychology cannot lead. Psychology must bow down and submit to the authority of scripture. And so there's nothing wrong with you having self-worth. But your self-worth can't be all about you. I've got self-worth because of him. And therefore, I'm valuable just as, yes, I'm valuable. You can't be valuable just as you are, only if you have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I know that I'm valuable because Jesus hung, bled, and died for me. Therefore, when you treat me, you understand that I am a vessel of value, not because I am Howard Earl Jr., but because I am a child of God. That is what gives me value because in myself, I'm nothing more than a filthy rag. I'm not worthy of his love. I'm not worthy of his blessing. I'm not worthy of his favor. I'm not worthy of his blessing. As good as you are, as straight as your hair is, as white as your teeth are, as much money as you have, still you are no good in the eyes of God. The only thing that makes you valuable is his blood. And so here Jesus says that you must be willing to hate your own life. That you got to be willing now to absolve yourself of whatever you think gives you value outside of Christ. 
That's what surrender looks like. Losing your life. He goes on to, 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 to further press this by giving us these two parabolic illustrations. There's the builder of the tower and the king going to war. Let me tell you something about, about this whole self-centeredness. Self-centeredness has truly undermined discipleship. Christian marketing is all has been infiltrated, hijacked by self-centeredness. Think about the lingo and the language and the terminology. Everything is so me-centered and me-focused. I need my breakthrough. I need a word from the Lord. I want to get my blessing. Unleash your potential. Get the most out of God and to maximize this and get this and that. And everything is about us. And we've made Christianity a matter of an individual journey and perspective. But when God saves us, he does not save us unto ourselves. That Jesus did not die on the cross just for you to get your breakthrough while everybody else perishes around you. Jesus saved you, and when he saved you, it was a matter of investment. That he invested in your life, that you might invest your own life in someone else, and that someone else may then grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is telling the people in the crowd, now listen, this might not be what you want. I want you to understand the real cost here. This is what is at stake. No man sets out to build a tower without first, without first taking proper inventory, making sure that he has enough resource. Heaven forbid he gets into the project and runs out of resource and has an unfinished project and becomes the ridicule of the community. Everybody walks by and all they see is, yep, he started out doing it too big, didn't have enough. That's such a shame. Jesus said, you don't want your life to look like that in terms of discipleship. He said, "You, y'all, this whole crowd thing is cute. But if that ain't what it's about, walking with me is not about what you see from the crowd. Think about that. Walking with Christ is not all about what you see on Sunday morning. Walking with Christ every day ain't hallelujah Lord. Thank you Jesus. Lord you've been so good and you're worthy. Every day should be that but some days it's like Lord how could you? Lord I hurt. It's hard being me. Lord, take this cup from me. Have you been there before? It ain't always a cakewalk walking with God. Some days are harder than others. And he says that you must be willing to hate your own life. And then he does this. He attaches this whole narcissistic thinking me-centered focus, and he attaches it to your material life. Oh, yeah, look right here. Uh, verse number 33, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has, any of you who does not give up everything Everything. Just to make sure y'all understand me here. Everything that you have. That's, you, you know how you know when you truly surrendered? You truly surrender 
when you can still serve and worship and honor with the same zeal and intensity when there has been significant reduction in your life. In other words, it's easy to give him the highest praise when you employed. It's easy to give him the highest praise when you the man at home. It's easy to give him the highest praise when you are made to, when you are told that you are the finest thing. When you the apple of their eye. It's easy to give him the highest praise when it is sunny in your life. But let the bottom fall out. Can you still give him the hallelujah praise? Can you still honor him and serve him with the same passion and zeal? Jesus says, you want to be in the crowd, but the crowd don't make you a disciple. Because if you're going to be a disciple, can you serve me if you didn't have nothing? I'm in the Bible. Y'all remember the rich young ruler? He said, teacher, how can I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, you need to go and obey all the commandments. Well, I kept all the I do all of that. He said, I'll tell you one more thing you need to do. He said, sell everything you have and give to the poor. He started out happy. Teacher. You know, teacher. Teacher. He was proud because he knew I'm keeping all the commandments. Teacher. I'm keeping all the commandments and I got money in my pocket. Y'all, last week I showed y'all the money walk. You know, the, the money walk when you're on your toes, you know. You got that money walk. He, he had the money walk. Teacher. I'm keeping all the commandments. I ought to be good for eternal life, right? And Jesus says, well, go and sell everything you got and give to the poor. Because he was a rich young ruler. And the Bible said he didn't even engage further in the conversation. The Bible says he walked away sad. Jesus didn't even take anything from him. He had the same money, but he didn't have the same walk. Discipleship. Stop, 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 stop making discipleship be a matter of finances. Stop thinking that 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 because you ain't got what somebody else got some kind of way it means you can't serve. And stop hiding behind that pseudo-spirituality and taking offense, thinking that people are doing this great disgrace and disservice because they're asking you to make financial investment in your own spiritual development. Stop being offended because you have to pay $2 and $3 for a book. And saying, ain't nobody got money to be doing that. Oh, yeah, I told you, I was going to mess with you. <laughs> Knowing you can't even get a half a set of nails for $5. Now, I ain't, I, I, it's been a long time since I sat and got a manicure. And I know inflation is on the rise and it might cost you a little bit, but I ain't never, I ain't never heard of nobody getting half a set, you know, five nails, you know. You see my point? And we think then, how dare we charge people for Bible study? How dare we charge people? We're charging people to teach them the Bible and all that. Mm -mm, no, they ain't going to fly with me. I'm asking you to make an investment. Because I know that you don't lose no sleep 
It makes all the sense in the world to invest in your hair, in your car, invest in your wardrobe. We make investments all the time. But when it comes to spirituality, some kind of way it ought to be free. That's crowd mentality. That's crowd mentality. So now, which one are you? Sure. Sure, there could be some studies that don't have to, well, you don't have to pay anything. In fact, just to read, you know, the thing is, here's what trips me out. That people take offense to all that and they don't even have their own Bible. But you have the audacity to be offended when you're asked to pay for a $5 book. But you don't even own a Bible, a personal Bible, a personal Bible. But you're telling us that we're some kind of way sacrilegious. is telling us if you want to be my disciple you got to be willing to give up everything you have everything is he saying that everybody in here now you need you got you need to just be homeless and just poor no but I bet he is saying everybody in here got too much stuff Too much stuff. And it's the maintenance of the junk in our lives that undermines our own discipleship. Yeah, sure it does. Because some kind of way we, we have associated the blessing of God and the favor of God. We've attached it to the acquisition of junk. Because in God's eyes, that's all it is, is junk. I don't care how many carrots it is, it's junk. It can be 14 carat, it can be platinum, it could be rose gold, it could be fool's gold, it could be aluminum foil, it's junk in the eyes of God. Because all the carrots in the world still don't compare to the crimson red blood of Jesus Christ. And the cross that he hung on was nothing but wood. But his blood washed me whiter than snow. And yet I will bow down to take care of my diamonds, to take care of my Cadillac, to take care of my house, to take care of my clothes. All of that stuff. And none of it will add any value to your life. And we make statements like, I don't have time get this money. I got to pay these bills. I got to do this and I got to do, oh, I'm out there real bad. I'm, oh yeah. I didn't know it was going to go like this, did you? But I'm taking you back to what Jesus said. Because he addressed the crowd. He addressed everybody. There were people who were in the crowd who were infatuated with him. I don't want you to mistake your infatuation with Christ to be discipleship. I don't want you to assume now that because you show up, that that means you are a disciple. I don't want you to believe that because you have a t-shirt that says D up, That does not make you a disciple. I wish that all it took was a cowboy's jersey. I wish that if I had a jersey, I could go through the mall. They could have the number one on it and say Earl on the back. And people will flock to me and want my autograph because they've seen me on TV. But y'all know, we've seen people. How many times have you seen folk wearing a Barry Sanders jersey? 
and you know for a fact, just by looking at the body type, <laughs> I know that ain't embarrassing. <laughs> just because you got the jersey doesn't mean you on the team. And just because we got the t-shirt and the cross and the lingo and the building and the activities does not make us disciples. Last thing, last thing. I must be willing to endure suffering. This is another controversial element of the Christian life. Popular psychology and even popular theology, popular ecclesiology, a po and popular and contemporary congregational life, suffering has been removed from Christian experience to the point that suffering has negative connotations. But suffering is an essential element in the Christian journey. I'm going to say it again. Suffering is an essential element of the Christian life. That suffering is necessary for you to grow. That if you have not endured some measure of suffering that there is some measure of growth that you are yet to experience. Because there's some stuff that you just can't appreciate until you have suffered. And so there is no, you can't appreciate victory without suffering. How do you know what it feels like to win if you don't know what it feels like to lose? You don't know you got a good thing until you've had enough bad things in your life. And so Jesus tells the crowd, he tells the crowd, if you're going to be my disciples, you got to be ready to take up your own cross. He said, take up your cross. After Peter's confession, Jesus said, who do people say I am? Disciples got to talking. Well, some, they said, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say, well, you're Elijah, one of the prophets, all that. Peter said, well, you are the Christ. Son of the living God, Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And upon this confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the very next paragraph, if anyone should come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Here Jesus tells, the, that's what he told the disciples. But right here he tells the crowd, he says, that anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Oh, yeah. We want all of the fame and the fortune. And we want the Lord to keep the suffering. We want all the trimmings and trappings of this blessed life, this blessed material life. And we seem to think that if it don't shine and if it ain't bling, if it's not comfortable, if it's not cushy, and if it doesn't make me look good externally, it's not valuable. I know a whole lot of people got a lot of stuff I could never imagine, and yet they can't sleep at night. I know people got all kind of cars, ain't got nowhere to drive them to. I know people got all kind of bedrooms and square footage, Big house, but it don't make it a home. I know people, they got, they got all the money in the world and buy anything they want. And they sit down at tables with all kind of chairs and seats and they sit there by themselves at night. We know people, they try to purchase some friendships and relationships. There are people out there who are looking for people, you know, groupies. They want to be a part of the crowd and want to be compensated for their company. Not adding any value to their host life. Jesus says that you must be willing to take up 
your cross. The cross is a universal symbol for suffering. And we like to associate the cross strictly to Jesus. We like to think, well, the cross is just about, that was just for Jesus. But Jesus says that you have a cross. And not only that, Jesus says that you got to take up your cross, how often? Daily. Which means that Jesus says there is a measure of suffering every single day that you must endure. That if you're going to be my disciple, that there is a part of you that must be dying. You must be dying to yourself on a daily basis and following me. That's what it means to be a disciple. Crowd folk don't want to suffer. Crowd people want to be comfortable. Crowd people want the weather always to be nice. And any time they get uncomfortable, crowd people let you know they're uncomfortable. Crowd people don't want to be inconvenienced. Crowd people want to drive up, get it, and drive out, and never be and never be inconvenienced. Drive, I mean, crowd people want to pull up and get it while the car is still running. In fact, crowd people don't even want to get it. They want it to be given to them. And given to them on their terms and their timing, and they won't want anything expected of them. But that does not make you a disciple. Jesus says, Take up your cross and follow me. There is no discipleship void of suffering. It's why it troubles me when people distance themselves from the community. Because they say, I'm going through some stuff. That's bad theology. If anything, you ought to, we ought to see more of you when you're going through stuff. Because the truth is, you can't do nothing about your suffering. Next time somebody tell you, you know, I'm going through some stuff, so I'm going to back up for a little bit. I'm going to be, I'm going through stuff. Ask them, what you going to do about it? How you fixing it? So you going to stop coming to church, or stop coming to worship, stop engaging with the community, because uh, you're going through something. So you're going to, to, to stop being the church, stop allowing the church to be the church for you. You're going to stop being a Christian, stop doing what Christians do because you're going through something. So you're going to stop doing and being the very thing that nurtures and keeps and sustains you because you're going through something. And so when you stop doing what sustains and keeps you, tell me how that will help you. That's what it means discipleship. There's accountability. And so when people talk like that, you got to, you can't let them stay in that place. You, if you got to get, they got to hang up on your face. At least you know you tried. They slam the door in your face. At least you know you tried. They, if they avoid you and don't want to talk to you no more, at least you know you tried. But you can't say, okay, I'm going to pray for you. That ain't enough. That's not enough. Pray for them, but also challenge them. Tell them it's warfare. And Satan wants you to isolate yourself and be by yourself because he knows you are no match for him by yourself. But he knows he can't handle you when you're with the rest of us. Because when you suffer, we all suffer. But the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I'm in their midst. You can't do it by yourself, but you need me, and I need you. And so come in. We're going to walk through this thing together. When you suffer, you grow. I don't know about y'all, but some of y'all, sometimes I know I'm 10 feet tall, not because of what I got, but because of what I've been through. Because I've been through hell and back, and if it had not been for the grace of God, hey, I don't know where I would be. But God says that I will hold you and I will keep you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I've learned how to pray the prayer. Father, take this cup from me. But not my will, your will be done. Anybody been there before? You know it was nobody but God who held you when you cried at night. 
Come on, don't get so holy on me. Somebody knows what it feels like to suffer. And it's all right to suffer. You can have dignity and honor in your suffering because Jesus is there when you suffer. All of your suffering is not your fault. But the Bible says count it all joy when you go through diverse trials and temptations. But knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be entire and complete. Lacking nothing. So it's all right when you're going through something. It's all right to be going through something. Don't be ashamed when you're going through something. Know this, when you're going through something, God is doing something. So instead of saying, I'm going through something, tell somebody, God is doing something with me. I know I don't look good right now, but God is doing something. I know it hurts me right now, but God is doing something. Don't let my tears make you uncomfortable. God is doing something right now. Don't be upset with me. God is doing something right now. Don't give up on God. God is doing something right now. God is speaking in your life. God is moving in your life. God is working in your life. God is up to something. And we can't see him all the time. We can't feel him all the time. But he's always there. That's what the Bible says, that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to purpose. And so when it starts raining in your life and people want to know what's going on, tell them, well, God is up to something. I don't know what, but he's up to something. I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know how, but I know God will do something. I don't know how he's going to fix it, how he's going to bring me out, but God will bring me out. Because God will make a way out of no way, won't he? God will, God specializes in the impossible, doesn't he? God knows how to get you over your mountains, get you through your valleys. God will bring you through. Can I get a witness in here? God will bring you through. Can I get a witness in here? God will bring you through. Can I get a witness in here? God will bring you through. Can I get a witness in here? Have you tried him? God will make a way out of no way. Say yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. just got to praise him like I got it right now. I might not have it yet, but it's on the way because he's worthy. He's God and he's worthy of everything I got. It might not look tight right now, but from where I see it, God is up to something. It might not look like it's coming together yet, but you just keep walking with God and keep trusting with God. Knowing that weeping may endure for a night, but the Bible says joy comes in the morning. So you just got to excuse me sometimes. Every now and then I just got to get outside of the norm. Every now and then I got to get off the paper. Got to get off the script. Got to remind myself that God is in this thing. And no matter what people say, no matter what doctors say, no matter what the numbers say, no matter what the lawyers say, no matter what the bank says, God is in this thing. And God will do what only God can do. And I'm waiting for the time when people say, how did you do it? It was nobody but the Lord. I'm waiting for people to say, how did you make that? It's nobody but the Lord. I'm waiting for that time where I can say, look what God did. Oh, yeah. That's what discipleship is about. See, there is an element of intelligence in discipleship, but there's also an element where you just get kind of crazy in discipleship. 
There's a place in discipleship where there is an undignified level of praise. It's, there's an element of discipleship where it is not necessarily, um, it's not decorum. It's not neat and it's not pious and proper. There's a part of discipleship where tears flow and snot comes out of your nose and, and you sweat out of your clothes and, and your words don't come together and your subjects and your verbs don't agree and you just say, but the Lord said that he would do it and all you can do is just quote the scriptures of the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd and he shall not walk. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. But you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head. My cup overflows. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God, you're my God. Your mercy endures forever. Are you in the crowd? Are you in the crowd? Are you going to be a disciple? You decide. You going to be in the crowd? Are you going to be in the disciple? Crowd folk can complain. I'm telling you now, we got enough crowd people. Got enough crowd people. But what we need are disciples. And disciples trust God. They walk with God. They surrender to God. They submit to God. They endure with God. Disciples endure with you. Disciples don't beat you down. They build you up. Disciples don't love you in your face stab you in your back. Disciples go to bat for you. Disciples pray over you and with you. Disciples serve you. Disciples love you. Disciples love God. Disciples show up no matter who else shows up. Disciples do whatever it takes to get there. Disciples sit down and pray with other people. Disciples are not, what, not afraid to tell somebody no. Disciples stand when nobody else will. Disciples serve when nobody else will show up. Disciples don't wait for other people to get it started. Disciples get it started themselves. See, crowd people need the crowd. Disciples don't need crowds. Counsel, stand with me. Stand with me. I'm not finished. I'm just going to stop. We're just going to keep talking about discipleship until the Lord comes back. Some form or fashion, we're going to be talking about discipleship. So right now, there's somebody here. And you need to, you need to make a decision. You came in and you came in a part of the crowd. Had no idea that God was going to speak to you today. I believe God's calling somebody out of the crowd into the core. God's calling somebody out of the crowd of obscurity into the circle of significance. God's calling somebody out of hiding into greater experience and fellowship with him. That means that there's somebody in here right now and you're tired of sitting out on the fringes you're tired of sitting in the cheap seats. You're tired of sitting way up top, looking down on the field, watching everybody else have a good time. You can run touchdowns too. And you can start your journey right now. All I need you to do is just, just come, come this way. Come towards me. You coming doesn't make you a bad person. You coming doesn't mean that you are, you know, you are this awful, sinful person whose life is a mess. Like I said, you can look, you can have it all together on the outside. Good credit, good job, business casual attire, good language, all that. But inside, you can be disconnected. 
And what you look on the outside doesn't even matter. And what these folk think of you based on what they see doesn't matter. What matters is that you're saying, God, I'm coming closer to you. I don't know what this means for me other than that I believe that there's more that you want to do with me. And so I'm taking steps of surrender that you can do more with me. If that's your prayer, just come this way. We're not going to make you talk to people in here. We're not going to make you stand and face everybody and justify why you should be worthy of this. We're going to escort you into a place where there's privacy. We're going to counsel with you, answer your questions. God bless you, sister. Come on, don't let our sister walk alone. Don't let her walk alone. Somebody else is here. Somebody else is here. You see where she's, that's where you're going to go. You see, we don't even know what's about to happen, but she's going to a place where she's got privacy. I know that's what you're doing. Everybody's looking. Everybody's looking over like, what's going to happen now? See, you can do that. You can do that because I know you're here, brother. I know you're here, brother. I know you're here. Come on. Come on. We've been praying for you. I don't want you to be on the fringes any longer. I don't want you to be just up in the stands. I don't want you to be a face in the crowd. You can be on the team. You can be on the team. God bless your brother. Bless your man. You can be on the team. You can be on the team. That's what I'm talking about. Somebody walking with him. Nobody should have to walk alone. If you're here, why don't you come? Don't worry about trying to have it all figured out. This ain't about having it all figured out right now. It's just about what to get it done. And God will show us as we walk with him a little bit at a time. God bless you. God bless you. Walking with somebody, that's what it's all about. Maybe somebody else. Maybe somebody else, you're thinking about it. You're thinking about it. You're thinking about it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. So I know some of us, we came in thinking, man, ain't nobody at church today. It's going to be a quick one, but look what God is doing. Look what God is doing. You don't know who's here. And you're worried about who's not here. But look who is here. And you know what? God may be speaking to you. God may be saying, how come you're not getting up? Because you're in the crowd yourself. This is not just for people who are not a part of New Hope Baptist Church. You can be a member and still be in the crowd. Just because you're on the road doesn't make you a disciple. This is an invitation to discipleship. This is not an invitation to join the church, to join New Hope Baptist Church as much as it is an invitation to join Jesus Christ. And you don't know what it means to be a part of the church until you first become a part of the Christ. And if you're here, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? <laughs> Amen. Our worship is for real. I worship this for real. If you're here, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Amen. 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 Let's thank God today. Let's thank God today for what he's done. Amen. But you know what? We all here. We all here. Come on, choir. Come on, choir. We're going to sing this together. We're going to sing this together. Don't look at me. We're going to sing it together. They're getting it together. They're getting it together. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. 